The Syntax of Things by Arnisha Chapter 71 Parentheses Epilogue Say what you will, but if you ask me, I keep an eye on him. He killed him, right? He killed you-know-who. Who knows what else he's capable of? The tall woman flicked her cigarette, the ash falling on the freshly cut grass. Her blonde hair was tied into a neat, elegant ponytail, and a small rectangle card was pinned on her black robes. Etched in bold, bright red letters, the card read, Zamira Gulch, Daily Prophet Representative. The man kneeling next to her, adjusting his tripod once more, and charmed his bag open. A chunky wooden camera flew to him, and he caught it with both hands, grunting as he was almost thrown off balance. The tripod swayed as he attempted to mount the heavy device on it, and a small cloud of purple smoke emitted from its underside as it was finally installed. "'He's involved with the ministry, I heard, like, involved, involved. They used him as a distraction at first, but now they have bigger plans for him. Just wait and see.' "'Bigger plans!' a second man exclaimed. The notebook hovering next to his head opened at once at his words, and the quill that was tucked in it wrote them down quickly. Come on now, bigger plans. He's just a boy. Be serious. A boy who killed you know who, the woman insisted. His name is Voldemort. The three reporters turned their heads in surprise at the mention of the forbidden name. Harry approached them slowly, his voice glacial. Voldemort, he repeated. It's just a name. It means nothing. And Headmistress McGonagall said no cameras allowed. He placed his hand on top of the camera and pushed it downwards more aggressively than he'd intended. The woman whose cigarette had now slipped from her fingers and had fallen onto the hem of her robes seemed to have gone pale. Despite everything that had happened, it would take a lot more than a happy ending for people to stop fearing Voldemort's name. They were used to the fear. They were terrified of the dark as much as they were of the light. Who could trust that Voldemort was really gone? How, after knowing how close he'd come to immortality... The silence broke by the sound of another camera going off, flashing red in Harry's face and momentarily blinding him. He blinked slowly, willing his anger away. You heard me, he said. Piss off! My goodness, another man said, almost whispering, if it isn't Harry Potter himself. Harry clenched his fists. Look, just take a seat or leave, all right? This isn't an interview. We won't be answering any questions. So if you came here for that, just go away. You're hardly welcome as it is. He hadn't meant to say it like that, but these days he could barely control himself. Simply using his voice now seemed an achievement. The last time he'd done so was probably days ago, a brief thank you, Miss Weasley, when he'd been offered a tasteless sandwich or a sure yeah, maybe later, when Ron had suggested that they go for a walk. At some point over the past few weeks, talking had become challenging and surreal, like screaming into a pillow or whispering to someone who stood miles away with his back turned and his hands over his ears. Too late, Harry realized that getting involved in a quarrel now was a mistake. His sudden appearance had rather excited the reporters instead of discouraging them. Cameras came to life one after another, and the whispers spread hectically to the back of the group. Harry Potter, they said, and here, and watch out, and it's him. Harry had no time to protect himself. He was surrounded by them instantaneously and was bombarded with outrageously stupid questions, all of them spoken at once, delirious shouts attempting to overthrow each other as microphones and parchments flew around his head. Will you be running for Minister of Magic, Mr. Potter? Well, like, what? Your opinion of the dark arts, if you please. Is the Dark Lord really gone? Are you related to you know whom? A comment on the new headmistress, perhaps. Granting, Harry pushed through them to free himself, and he literally tripped over his feet as more reporters ran towards him from across the yard, blocking his way. Is that Harry Potter? Never in my life! Mr. Potter, Mr. Potter, for a statement, please! A your speech. I won't be giving a speech, Harry muttered, although no one heard him. The boy who lived or the boy who killed? Will you please sign this, Mr. Potter? All right, stop, he said, but the loud circle only tightened around him. Stop, stop, stop! Something snapped inside Harry. He nearly choked on his bit as a hot wave blasted through him and accelerated, hitting the people surrounding him and jolting them backwards. The gadgets flying over his head dropped to the ground, unmoving and smoking as though they'd been burned. A handful of the reporters landed on their backs several feet away. Harry stared. He wasn't even holding his wand. He didn't mean to. His throat clenched. I... He started, but he was still screaming into the pillow, and he was still whispering to someone miles away. 
He rubbed his eyes, his cold sweat foreign on his shaking fingers. I, sorry, sorry, I didn't. He ran to the woman called Gulch, extending his hand to help her up. She only shifted backwards, though, her fingers creeping into her robes to find a wand. Well, this magic, she said. The rumors are true. Harry stepped back, brushing the dirt off their clothes and helping each other up. The reporters looked at Harry as though he was Lord Voldemort himself. Despite their renewed curiosity, they were hesitant to approach him again now, lingering at a safe distance instead. "'It's true colors have been revealed,' one of them said. "'Why am I not surprised?' "'I'm sorry,' Harry mumbled again, stumbling off at a quick pace, eager to flee the scene. He snatched at whatever parchment or notebook attempted to follow him and tossed them to the ground, refusing to slow his steps. "'I'm sorry,' hurrying past the chairs and the people and the tall tents. His feet took him to Hagrid's hut, where the crooked footpath meant a wobbly scarecrow and a pumpkin patch. Once he was out of everyone's sight, he leaned against a tree and took off his glasses. He couldn't do this. He didn't want to. He hugged his torso and he willed his giddiness away, tasting soot under his tongue as he leaned forward. His lungs were out of air. The entire world was out of air. And all he was left with was one last breath that he had now wasted in a snort. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. A butterfly flew past him and Harry was startled. He looked at her angrily, as though she was the one responsible for his misery. He imagined crushing her into his fist or maybe under his shoe. The thought made his stomach lurch again and he felt disgusted. He used to like colorful bright mornings, especially here at Hogwarts. He used to love the freshness and the subtle breeze. None of that reached him now. His surroundings felt artificial, made of paper, thin and translucent. He could rip them apart if he wanted. He could take a peek and see what really hid underneath them. He could face the truth, the real truth, that nothing was more terrifying than living, not even dying. There are worse things than fear, things I doubt you could ever stand to even witness. But he had. He'd witnessed them and he'd survived. Wasn't that what he always did anyway? Wasn't that enough to bring him peace? To bring him happiness? He'd be fine eventually, of course he'd be. Or so everyone said. Somewhere behind him, the great castle of witchcraft and wizardry towered graciously over the never-ending yard, bold and ancient. The weather-worn stones of the South Bridge Tower were still in ruins, surrounded by dead clumps of grass and the half-crumbled greenhouses with their caved-in roofs and dying plants. Where the Ravenclaw Tower used to be, now only a pit of grey dust and charred fine rubble remained. It didn't matter. They'd fix it all eventually, but not now. It was too soon. Too soon to worry about such things, and definitely too soon to admit that life could, perhaps, somehow, go on indeed. They'd think about bricks and stones once they had finished thinking about loss and demise, if ever. The butterfly flew by again, and seven long years of bittersweet memories flashed past Harry like limpid ghosts. Hogwarts was cursed. It had to be. And maybe this wretched place had somehow stolen a piece of his soul to keep and cherish and gnaw at for the rest of the time. Like a horcrux, he thought, but then again, not really. It made no sense for the memorial service to be held here. It was a mockery. It felt like walking all over the dead, leaving shoe marks on their faces and littering their bodies. So many lives have been taken by wrath and hate here, by the delusion of intrepidity and the compelling confidence that victory would undeniably come. It wasn't right, it wasn't right for the living to walk around at a place that reeked of death. Every part of Harry's surroundings threatened to consume him. He was desperate, desperate to flee and never return. So desperate, he'd stitch the invisibility cloak on his skin if he could, if it meant no interactions, no conversations. So desperate, he'd cancel time, so past, present, and future would all meddle together and lose meaning. Like a terrible recipe it'd be. One of those Aunt Petunia used to cook to impress her guests. Stupid wishes they were, impossible and irrelevant to how the gears of life usually worked. Time moved fast, unrelenting and unyielding. Disappearing wouldn't change that. Nothing would change that. A month had already passed since the war ended, and soon that would be two, three, four. Exactly here, only a few weeks ago, Voldemort had stood alive and strong. Now he was history. Harry juggled to himself silently and then nearly jumped up when someone touched his shoulder.
It was Kingsley Shacklebolt, dressed in dark, loose-fitting robes that bore the Ministry's badge on the front. He looked at Harry with concern, the same concern everyone looked at him with recently. It made Harry cringe. Hey, Harry said, looking away. The press giving you trouble? Harry shrugged his shoulders. Nope. I believe I saw the lot of them chasing you, Kingsley said. They must have been chasing someone else, sir. They'll jump to the next thing sooner or later, you know. Even Harry Potter himself can't entertain them forever. That's because I hurt them. Silence. The butterfly returned with a friend now, and they latched themselves on a rose bush, fluttering feverishly. How's it up again, then? Harry clenched his jaw. I've seen this before, more times than I could count, young man. Kingsley said, It won't last, but let me tell you. It happens to others, too, with all that they've seen. All right. Harry agreed flatly. Don't mind them, they're idiots. Harry nodded. They weren't idiots. They were human. Scared, curious, and occasionally nasty. He loathed them, but he couldn't hold it against them anymore. Not now that he knew how dreadful, how terrifying war could be, and how insignificant it could become once it was over. How stubborn the mind was when it came to remembering or to forgetting. Harry had discovered what real grief meant the day after Voldemort's fall, when reality cruelly kicked in, and there was no other distraction to occupy him any more. He cried, loudly, furiously, childishly. He was sure he cried, but it was impossible to tell because most of the time he was underwater, sunk in the middle of the deepest ocean. No one could see, no one could tell. But there were heavy rocks tied on his ankles and a muffliato on his lips and a suctum sembra on his heart. And with every attempt he made to smile or joke or to belong, the shackles only got tighter, and the muffliato hushed him further, and the suctum sembra cut him deeper. Some nights he was too depressed to even cry. Those nights he'd whisper into the mattress instead. Come back, he'd say, even as a shadow. Even as a dream, he was slammed downwards into his own mind, and he simply waited with open arms. Come back, please, please. Go up to me if it gets worse, Kingsley said. Your project. Okay. Then, it feels wrong being here. It would feel wrong anywhere else, too. Yeah, well, it's even wronger here, Harry joked. At the staircase, have you seen it? Outside the Great Hall, there's still... Blood, and you're the... You may stay at the back if you'd rather be with your friends. Harry shut his eyes. I'm sorry? We'd saved you a seat at the front. McGonagall wanted you next to her, but if you'd rather avoid this public, it's fine. Harry said before he could change his mind. I'll... Yeah, fine. But I'm not saying anything. I told her that. If they still want me to say a few words or whatever. Kingsley sighed. If only I could sneak away without having to say a few words myself. He chuckled. There's no pressure. There really is. Harry got him. Why do you think the prophet's here? He shoved his hand into his pocket, fishing at a couple piece of paper. My speech, he said. I didn't even write this, you know, sir. He remembered to add, Minister. Kingsley straightened the page, cocking his head as he read it. Who wrote this? I don't know, your secretaries. Harry snatched it back. I'm not saying anything, let alone some scripted bull. Control yourself, Severus snarled. Harry sighed. I'd really rather be left alone, if that is okay. Kingsley regarded him curiously, almost saddened at Harry's sudden loss of bravery. It occurred to Harry that he should be feeling some shame for it, perhaps. Some guilt or something. All he felt was tiredness. No one expects you to say anything, Kingsley said, but it was a lie. Come on, come, let's go. It's almost time. Placing his speech back into his pocket, Harry followed him back to the edge of the forbidden forest. There, where the stretching green of the yard ended and where the dandelions and the rambling roses gave place to the first soaring pines and oak trees, hundreds of chairs had been set out in even rows. A Nile ran down the center of them, and right at the front, a golden podium was placed on an elevated platform, Next to it, a marble headstone taller than the trees themselves was covered by a billowing white veil. It reminded Harry of an enormous ghost, and he briefly wondered whether it had come to haunt them. 
On the plain gray marble under the veil, the names of the fallen fifty had been carved one under another. One name was missing. Wizards and witches had started gathering already, all of them dressed in formal silky black gowns and traditional robes. Near the Quidditch pitch, a number of Wongate fence had been set up to accommodate the foreign schools in attendance. Bobatons and Durmstrang had sent their seventh years, and an academy called Ilvermorny had come with the entirety of their staff. Aries Tom, the landlord of the Leaky Cauldron, Arabella Fig, Harry's squib neighbor, Ernie Prang, driver of the night bus, Madame Melkin of the robe shop in Diagon Alley, and even Draco Malfoy, awkwardly standing by himself under the shade of a tent, unaccompanied by his parents. Orwars in uniform had formed small groups around the yard, chatting quietly, serene or sullen, while most Hogwarts students had already settled into chairs, waiting for the ceremony to begin. "'If you need anything,' Kingsley started, but Harry had already heard it before. "'Yes, sir. Thank you.' Kingsley nodded curtly, squeezing himself into the crowd and disappearing. Before Harry could do the same, Hermione's voice called his name from afar. There was no disappearing now. She had already seen him. She ran to him fast and threw her arms around his shoulders. Harry bolted up from the bed and hugged Severus in despair. His arms curled around his neck, his weight on his toes, his voice hoarse as he said, "'Where the hell have you been all this time?' Her money. Ron's about to have a breakdown, George, too. I wouldn't even mention Miss Weasley. I know. The things people said to him these days were awfully mundane. He was sure there was meaning in their words, but where exactly he didn't know. Hearing them talk was maddeningly draining, and he didn't want to bother. Their occasional expressions of affection resembled trains passing by at breakneck speed at night. They flashed for a moment, and then it was dark again. From where the Weasleys were seated, Ron motioned at them to wait for him, and Harry offered a nod of acknowledgment. His friend's face was paler than ever, his freckles bright red under the morning sun. They all hugged each other. Harry held his breath until it was over. You look terrible, he told Ron. No shit. How was everyone? Harry asked. They mounted in. Oh, they're not, don't know. No one's in the mood to be honest about how they feel, I think. George? Not well, mate. Not well. And Jenny didn't even come, she's still at home. She told me, Harry said, that she wasn't coming. She was up at the attic all night talking to the ghoul. Everyone's gone bloody mental, Ron mumbled. Harry had found comfort at the burrow after the battle. The Weasleys understood his need for silence because they felt it too. No one questioned him and no one tried to console him. Day and night, George wept. Ron kicked chairs and tables. Miss Weasley cleaned and cooked and cleaned and cooked and cleaned and cooked. And cooked. Bill smoked obsessively in the bathroom of the second floor, and Harry simply slept. His sleep was deep and nauseating, accompanied by the worst, most horrifying dreams. Promise me you're not going to die, Harry begged in the dark, clutching at Severus's chest with trembling fingers. Severus curled an arm around him and pulled him closer. Nightmare. And he only ever left his bed to take a piss or eat some bread or very gracefully vomit all over the floor. He told no one. He couldn't bring himself to. Severus wouldn't want him to. Harry followed his friend silently, his stomach tightening and his lips going numb with every step. His heart was out of control. His mind raced three ridiculous thoughts such as, We're probably all dead already. And what if I started screaming? And everyone knows. And... Who is to say there weren't more horcruxes we never found? He greeted Hagrid, exchanged smiles of politeness with Slughorn and Hooch, and finally collapsed on the chair next to McGonagall. His name should be with the rest, he told her bluntly before she had the chance to say anything at all. He looked straight ahead. He wasn't used to speaking to her coldly. We agree, Mr. Potter, she said, placing her hand on his. Harry shook it off, hating the touch. I told the orders. I told them everything. They didn't give up. His breath hitched and he bit his lip. Death Eater, they called him. We'll make it right, she said, but Harry didn't want to hear it. Nothing could make this right. I testified for hours. Hours. Days. I told... They called it a matter of... Of... They called it... I expect you to be strong now, she said. This is hardly the right time or place, Mr. Potter. This was exactly the right time, and exactly the right place. But Harry bit his lip and shut his mouth, because that's what being strong apparently meant. 
On the edges of the large marble stone, delicate flowers were evenly carved around the names of the fallen fifty, one for each unidentified body that was found in the ruins. Kingsley would explain so once the stone was unveiled. It was a sweet idea. A flower for each anonymous loss. But not a single mention of Severus's sacrifice. Not a flower, not a spike, not a root, not even a smidge. I'm not saying anything, he said. Oh, the speech sucks. I don't want to use my face, you know, by all my words. They didn't even let me write it. There is an awfully big amount of dunderheads in the ministry, Mr. Potter. I would pay no mind to them. Do you believe me? Harry asked. That he was on our side. I believe you. Then why don't we? Because it would upset many families. Harry shook his head. His leg was bouncing nonstop, and he gripped his knee to control it. You have not seen what I've seen, Potter. She said, I only ask for your patience. Harry jerked under him, turning his face away from Severus's kisses. Stop. No. He whispered, his voice cold. When you sober up. Severus cupped his face, kissing his cheek, his nose, the corner of his lips. When you. He jerked again, wriggling his leg free and kicking at the mattress with his shoe. When. We had a student this year in Gryffindor whose name was Tanya Ivanova. McGonagall continued, her voice low and somber. She was repeatedly tortured by the Carrots for being a half-blood. Severus Snape was in charge of Hogwarts at the time. He didn't. Ivanova lost her life the day of the battle by the Gin and Gus. She was eleven. Harry made no other attempt to interrupt her. Her family is sitting right there. She pointed suddenly with her chin. Would you want them to hear their daughter's name listed in company with that of the man they deemed responsible? No, Harry whispered. I believe you, she said again, but this is a ministry matter now. We are here to bring closure to these people, not insult them. His name will be cleared, and then we will have this conversation again. Yes? Yes, Harry said. He wasn't sure he believed it anymore. Don't mind them, he thought. I'll remember you, even if everyone else forgets. Yes, roll your eyes from heaven, it's fine. Just call me an idiot, and I'll look up to the stars and smile. There was no way to clear Severus's name, not really. He'd been fooling himself all this time, thinking he could make it happen. Everyone was simply playing along to keep him calm. It was Kingsley himself who had pushed Harry to testify. It was Miss Weasley who had begged him to take a shower first. And it was his own conscience that told him to steal himself and provide proof that Dumbledore had indeed been killed under an agreed arrangement. But Harry didn't know what proof he could ever show them. Memories weren't enough, not by the ministry standards, and sharing Severus's memories felt wrong, regardlessly. He could still tell them, though, tell them without the memories, testify again, write it all down, and open his heart one last time for the entire world to see. Describe to them the man behind the mask, although he'd be damned if he even dared to assume that he had known Severus Snape at all. Kingsley stepped onto the platform, cleared his throat, and the roller coaster of hell began. Harry listened with his head bowed, the muffled cries of the people around him united in the face of sorrow. Fent is like a standstill. Kingsley began, and Harry fought the urge to cover his ears and beg for this to end already. It changes direction, chases us, pushes us forward, and occasionally stalls us. We turn and we turn again until the storm adjusts. Why? Because this storm isn't something that blew in from far away. This storm is us. Today we are gathered here to remember those whose internal storm consisted of supreme endurance and courage. Were he alone, Harry would have laughed. Most of the kids who died that day knew nothing of this war, nor had they taken sides. They weren't heroes. They were 11 and 12 year olds like Ivanova. Their internal storm had merely urged them to get up and go to class. The fact that death had found them on their way there had nothing to do with courage. They were victims of circumstance and nothing more. The presence of Harry Potter adds a special significance to this ceremony, he heard Kingsley say. Everyone's heads turned to him at once, the whispers increasing. A bright light flashed at Harry and then another, so much for no cameras allowed. He said nothing because protesting would only extend this torment further. The speech was long and unbearable. Harry paid little attention to it. His focus shifted to a muddy smutch on his left shoe instead, and he fixated there, as though his life depended on it. He thought of blood, a sliced open throat that was drenched in it, of shaky hands and matted hair. He heard quick pained gasps, the bleeding throat drawing air in quickly. 
that he could not close his ears against. It had been engraved on the core of his soul. McGonagall's name was suddenly mentioned, and Harry looked up, realizing that Kingsley's speech was over. McGonagall rose from her seat and walked up to the platform to take over. Harry looked around for Ron and Hermione, but they were nowhere to be seen. Another camera flashed at him, and Harry glared at the reporter heatedly. Little Branstone, McGonagall read, her voice loud and clear. Graham Pritton, Flora Charles, Fred Weasley, Colin Creevy, Namus Lupin. The names went on and on. Harry felt defeated, truly entirely irreparably crushed. He tried to breathe, and then his fortitude was simply gone. Let me mourn one death before I mourn a hundred. Aware of the filthy stares he was getting, he jolted up from his chair and walked away as fast as he could, teetering and almost knocking down a couple of chairs in his hurry to leave. His face was wet, but for the life of him he couldn't recall when he'd broken into tears, and his vision was blurry despite wearing his stupid glasses. He didn't know where to go. He followed his shaky feet and trusted them to take him somewhere better. Anywhere, really. And what a satisfying performance he was putting on for the press. They truly love this. Harry Potter running away from this not once, but twice in a row. How laughable he was, really. What would the headlines say tomorrow? Boy, who was also Voldemort, finally demonstrates the disturbingly unstable behavior we've been warning you about since he was born. It'd be such a smash. This time, he made it past Hagrid's hut uninterrupted, and so he kept walking, wishing to get so far into the forest that no one would bother looking for him again. When he reached the shoreline of the Black Lake, far from everyone's judgment and assumptions, Harry finally collapsed on his knees and wept. The water nuzzled the edges of his robes, drenching them quickly as it traveled upwards through the fabric. Harry was shattered to pieces, and yet somehow time hadn't stopped moving forward. Every passing minute was extending the distance between Harry and Severus. There was no going back now. The stretch between the present and the last time they'd seen each other would only expand. Day after day, without ever taking a break or showing mercy. You're a fool, Severus would say. Move on. But Harry would love him anyway. He wished he could talk to him. Severus would know what the next step should be. He'd tell him what to do, how to get over this. But Severus was not here, and he'd never be here again. And even if he was, he'd have no advice to give because there was no telling what could have happened had he survived. Would they have found happiness, atonement, fulfillment? Would they have made each other happy? Would they have made it work? No way to know anymore. Severus had been freed from all this. Harry wasn't so lucky. Needing to breathe before he died of suffocation, Harry untied Severus's scarf from around his neck and yanked it off. He held it on his lap and looked at it as though it held the secret meaning of the world. It did. He clutched at it, and his tears ran down his face hotly. His shoulders shook. He gasped for air, but his lungs were shut. Clear your mind, Potter. As though he could. A stupid Ladson, that had been a waste of time. Severus should have taught him how to clear his heart instead. Oh, here you are. Hermione appeared from behind the trees, the dead leaves crackling under her feet as she walked up to him, sighing in relief. I thought you left. But I did, Harry thought. Never mind that someone had to ruin it again. He glanced at her in panic as though caught in the act of committing some atrocious crime. He immediately wiped his face with the back of his hand, trying to force his breathing under control. He didn't want her here now. He didn't want anyone here in any kind of here, not now, and not for a long time. Hermione kneeled next to him, and Harry reflexively turned his head away. Once upon a time, Harry and Severus had kissed here. It had been a nice night, a simple one. Harry was happy, and as usual, Severus was horrified by it. Harry would have smiled at the memory if he didn't feel that the earth might crack in two and devour him any moment now. It'll be all right, said Hermione in a soothing voice. I'd like to be alone now. Sorry. Are you sure? Yes, please. I'll come in a bit. Harry, you're my best friend. Harry stared at the scarf, not understanding the relevance of the statement. It almost upset him. I know. Tell me what's wrong, then. A jolt cry escaped Harry's throat. We were at a funeral for more people than I could count. What else could be wrong? I know there's more. It's been for a while, hasn't it? A dilemma. 
to die of nostalgia for something that he'd never experience or to go after Severus and simply pay the price. No matter how hard Harry looked inside himself, he only saw darkness. Hermione waited, her face shadowed by a familiar frown of concern. And as much as it always irritated him, it was also what had brought them close so many years ago. It was what built their friendship and made her indeed the best friend in the world. Don't tell, Severus would it want you to. Don't tell, don't tell. I was in love with him, Harry said. Hermione tilted her head. With him? Severus Snape. Silence followed, grave and heavy. Unlike anything Harry had felt before, in it he could hear everything. Hermione's disbelief, Harry's dashed hopes, and Severus's trembling voice whispering, Look at me. He was shocked when Hermione's hand crept on his lap, carefully brushing her fingertips against the silky scarf. Is that? Is. Yes. Hermione drew her hand away as if she'd been electrified. Harry feared he might. Harry feared she might be appalled by it. We slept together, he could tell her. Just once, a brief glimpse of some true connection, and then everything was lost. He could tell her. But those cars were best left alone. I don't know what to say, she said with some effort. Is this where you were going? At night? When you'd leave the dorms all the time? Please don't say anything bad about him. Not now. Not here. Okay, she said so quietly, Harry could have imagined it. I keep thinking, he croaked, hoping his fringe would hide his tear-stained face. I know, I know. I should have done something. I could have saved him, no matter how hard I tried to just... Whatever, I don't know, move on or something, I guess. I just can't stop thinking of it, of how he... Died. Harry drew in a breath. He died, and I just sat there and... And... All the things I could have done to save him, and I just didn't. It wasn't his fault. He knew that. He knew it. But all he wanted was to be alone and blame himself. He'd earned the despair. He owed it to him. Severus deserved better. He didn't deserve to be erased from history like this. There was nothing more we could do, Harry. For no one. I know, he said between his teeth. But it's not enough, Hermione. It's not... Enough. The pain inside him was threatening to burst out, and Harry dreaded what might become of him if he let it. But what did it matter? Who would remember the life of Severus Snape? Harry would. Despite all the secrets and the hypocrisy and the anger, Harry knew that Severus had been loved. He had been loved deeply and truly and blindly, and a fragment of his soul must have surely felt that twitch of happiness for all the good it did to him. It'll never be enough, Hermione agreed. But we have to move on. We have no other choice. Harry wiped his tears again and raised his eyes to the sky. Yeah, we do. He snapped his trembling fingers, reaching into his pocket to find his wand. You don't get it, Hermione. I don't want to remember anything anymore. I don't want to live without him. There's no point in... He pressed his wand against his own temple, wishing to remove all the memories, to pull them out one by one until nothing was left to completely, permanently erase them forever, only to realize that he didn't know the spell for such a thing and that he was just embarrassing himself further. He let out a sob as Hermione attempted to push his wand away from his head. Calm down! Don't! Don't tell me to calm down! You know nothing! Ari? Ron's voice came from somewhere behind them, and Harry wished for death. He didn't want to deal with either of them now. He didn't want to see them, to be seen by them. Nothing. He didn't want to be here or to be in general anyway. This was too much. Too much. Harry knelt on his other side and grabbed Harry's wrist furiously, forcing him to loosen his grip on the wand. What the hell are you doing? For Mullen's sake. Ron seized Harry's wand and took it away, securing it out of sight in his own pocket. So bloody rude to try and die at a funeral, mate. Ron exclaimed, rubbing Harry's back. Would totally steal the show. Harry couldn't bring himself to smile or to respond. He was still shaking. Harry's just upset with all this, Hermione tried. No, no more lies. I want to tell him. Ron's hand still on his back. Tell me what? What is it? Hermione squeezed Harry's arm. She whispered, Is this the moment? The moment for what? Asked Ron. No, not really. He said, The moment was about two years ago. Tell me what? 
Ron repeated. Fresh tears streamed down Harry's face, but this time he made no effort to hide them. I wanted to tell you, both of you, before Dumbledore was at Hogsmeade that day. I tried to tell you. Bad timing, I guess. He took a deep breath and let it all go. Forgive me, Severus, if I don't talk all drown. In fifth year, I saw Severus's memories, remember? About the prophecy and all. Ron stiffened, but Harry forced himself to ignore it and keep going. I needed occlumency lessons, right? I knew. I'd found out that he was loyal to Dumbledore. I'd seen proof, undeniable proof, his own memories, yes. But Voldemort had such easy access to my mind back then. Just by having seen those memories, I put Severus at immediate risk. Dumbledore feared Voldemort might take a peek into my mind and find out the truth. So that summer, I didn't go back to Surrey. I stayed with Severus so he could teach me how to seal my mind. I lied to you, I'm sorry. He glanced at Ron, but averted his eyes again quickly at the look of caution and apprehension. I would have told you the truth. He went on. I swear I would, never mind Dumbledore not wanting me to. I didn't tell you because things got complicated. I don't like where this is going, Ron said rigidly. Let him finish, Hermione said, still squeezing Harry's hand in her own. It's going where you think it's going, Harry whispered. Yeah. He couldn't remember seeing Ron carrying such an expression of complete disgust before, perhaps not even when he'd thrown up a dozen of slugs in one go. Nevertheless, too late to back down now. He killed Dumbledore, and I hid it myself. I wanted to die, not just because of what he did, but because of how stupid I thought I was, having trusted him, having loved him. Ron's words came out as a joke. My God, Harry! He never hurt me, Harry continued. I understand if it sickens you. I know what you think of him. But he didn't. He never. I stalked him, kind of, went after him again and again. Trust me, he put up a very good fight before giving in. Uh, what? Ron said half-heartedly. You went off the Snipe. Snape, Harry said. Is he talking about Snape? Biting her lip, Hermione nodded. No, no, he's not, Ron said. He's not talking about Snape. You're not talking about Snape. I am, Harry said. Ron licked his lips. You're not talking about Snape. You loved Snape. Sniffling, Harry nodded. I loved Snape. Ron blinked. You've gone mad. Please tell me you've gone mad. He begged. It's the truth, Harry said. Last summer, he was with me at the safe house. The order knew. No, what? That you... No, not that. Just that he was visiting me, that he mentored me. Ron rubbed his face. What are you talking about, Harry? He muttered, his eyes shut. What are you saying? I thought someone might have looked after you at the safe house, said Hermione. Then, Harry, this doesn't sound right. I know, Harry said weakly. I don't care. You're wound up, Ron said. Up to your ears with all this pressure. I'm not making it up, Ron. I'm not crazy. It was because of him that I knew. That I knew. That's how I figured it out. He had these magazines and... Anyway. He didn't know what to say. He wasn't sure he even made sense. I lived with him. We spent time together. Then one night he got drunk and... God! Ron mumbled again. And I made a move, I suppose. Or he did. It remains unclear to this day. He said huskily, but his friends didn't laugh. We didn't mean to. He was so angry with me. He recalled the ghost of a smile on his lips. He threatened to kick me out. He accused me of doing it with the intention to get him sacked. And so he told you to tell no one, Hermione interrupted. He, yeah. You can't possibly not hear how this comes across, she said. Making you feel in the wrong when... When he was the grown-up, the one in power, the one responsible for me. Yeah, I know how it comes across. He hissed. I know. Can you just... Just listen, just... Listen. He begged. I cannot debate this. I just want to share it the way everyone just shares. Without having to defend anything. Please. There was nothing in response. No word of acceptance. No go on. No tell us more. To silence. Harry broke the kiss, pressing his forehead against Severus's. He undid Severus's trousers slowly, unfastening the belt, and then moving on to the... Dot Snipes. 
Ron asked, noticing the scarf for the first time. Harry nodded. Ron and Hermione shared a sad look. They gave it to you. No, Harry said. I kind of stole it. Ron inhaled sharply. They took advantage of you, he muttered. Ron, Hermione said warningly. Not now. Harry shook his head. No, it's fine. I know you don't get it. I don't blame you. I thought you might reach all the wrong assumptions. No surprise there. I still wanted to tell you, though. I had to finally tell someone. That's where you were bloody going, Ron said defeatedly. He groomed you. No, he didn't. Harry smiled faintly. But I thought you'd say that, too. I also thought you'd probably never want to talk to me again after this, so yeah, I'm prepared. It won't be too surprising. Ron looked at Harry through parted fingers. I'm not leaving you, he said grimly. He seemed lost, like half expecting Harry to burst into laughter and tell him that this was a joke. Harry wished it was. You said he loved your mom. At first, yeah. At first. And you see nothing wrong with that. He did? But since when was love supposed to be a well-polished or mortally correct experience? Life was messy more often than not. And the emotions that came with it were just as messy, too. I loved your mom, and then he went after you, and somehow that doesn't creep you out at all. I went after him, Ron. I started it. I wanted him. It was that simple statement that put a hard stop to Ron's denial. Harry felt the change, the shift in Ron's mood at the sudden realization that Harry was indeed telling the truth. Harry felt a hot wave of rage coming for him even before it hit him. How could you? Here we go. I thought you hated him. Please, said Harry, too weary to fight. Are we still talking about Snipe? The Snipe. The one who killed Dumbledore. The one who wanted it to give Sirius to the Ministry. To the Dementors. He's one of your parents. He gave your parents to Voldemort. Ron, stop, Hermione whispered. He was like 15 years old. 38. Harry whispered. Well, close enough. He bullied you constantly. He made you miserable. All of us. He treated us like... Harry looked away. His throat was clenched around unimaginable sadness. He feared it might emerge in the form of a whale, so he kept his lips pressed together and his jaw tightly shut. What did he do to you? Harry shook his head. Act normal, he told himself. Don't collapse now. Just don't say something. Just say something. Um, taught me things occlumency mostly, and some legitimacy, and made me lots of terrible soups that first summer. He remembered. Most of the time, he just, What did he do to you? Ron pressed. Harry? Hermione started. Did he? Were you? Intimate? Harry shrugged. Doesn't matter. A pause. A little bit. A little bit intimate? Hermione asked. A little bit intimate. Harry repeated. There was another long silence after that. The scarf's edges were wet too now. Harry's shoes were filled with water and mud. Are we still talking about Snipe? Ron asked abruptly. You like kissed Snipe at such? Harry nodded. And such? Ron pressed. Yeah, and such. Ron covered his face with my hands. With Snipe, he repeated. Some would take my wand too, I'm begging you. You look miserable. How did you even keep all this a secret? What the hell? He said, I'd have exploded. I almost did, Harry muttered. He abused you. No, Harry said. I told you, he never. It was nothing like that. He pushed me away more times than I could count. Also, he made you think so you can keep going back. Ron shouted. So what, were you in contact with him all this time when I was worried sick about Jenny? You're not listening, Ron, Harry said. I had no idea he was on our side. I thought he betrayed me. Not telling you shit sounds pretty much like a betrayal to me, if you ask. Don't, Harry croaked. Just because you hated him, you don't get to impose your assumptions. We both hated him. Well, things changed, I guess. Sorry if that disappoints you. Disappoints me. Disappoints me. So what else is there, then? What other secrets have you been keeping? Did you shag Double Tortoon? Did you shag Voldemort? Stop it. Hermione hissed, but her voice was low enough to be conveniently ignored. Yes, Ron, go on. Make this about your feelings again. It wouldn't be the first time. I thought I knew you. Fat chance you did. Stop! Ron! Harry! Hermione repeated this time louder. Forget it. 
Harry shouted. I regret thinking you'd maybe- Oh, you regret! Did you not hear that right? You regret telling me, but you don't regret doing- And such with Snipe. Snipe! The same Snipe who took over Hogwarts and let the Death Eaters in! Yes, the same Snape. What are you gonna do, vomit in protest? Go on, then. I can't simply wrap my head around- Yeah, I'm sorry you don't have a bigger head, Ron. Around- Your brain would probably get lost in there. You and Snipe of all people! It was helpless. Screw this. Harry joked, trying to stand up and failing. To think I was stupid enough to hope for- Any- Understanding? Just give me back my wand. Why, so you get a father cadaver yourself or whatever the hell you were trying to do? Ron yelled. Give me back my wand! Harry yelled even louder. Never before had he felt losing control like this. He wanted to punch something. To destroy, to burn, to just break whatever stood in his way. Harry, Hermione said, will you please give it back, Ron? Harry threw his weight on his friend, his hands reaching for Ron's bucket and trying to wrestle his wand out of it. Ron gripped the wand through the fabric, and Hermione took hold of Harry's shoulders in a detectable impact, still pleading for both of them to stop. I don't think so, Ron said. You'll get it back when you calm down. With a fierce push, Harry broke out of Hermione's arms and attacked Ron, his vision going white. I said give it back! He didn't even land a punch. Ron was stronger than him, and he stilled Harry by holding his wrists together firmly. I'm not giving you your wand, he said. Pull yourself together. Pull Yourself. Together. Harry. Now. And Ron hugged him. Harry was caught off guard. It was a warm, tight embrace and Harry could have but melt a little in it. Hermione joined the hug and for the first time in ages, Harry felt an impossible weight being lifted off his chest. Surrendering in his friend's arms, he cried. A sense of insupportable loneliness surged from his lungs along with dread for some strange impending doom that had yet to come. His heart ached. Ron and Hermione held him close and he simply let go, bleeding a river of untold pain through his eyes. For a very long time, all he could hear was his own whimpering and the strange melody of the forest's bluebirds. It reminded him of the saddest songs, a delicate and soft lullaby that spoke of a time of healing of a bumpy road that must be traveled one step at a time. He found that the embrace was surprisingly welcomed and desperately needed. Harry allowed himself to feel at home. When all his tears had dried, he was left numb and exhausted. Don't say anything bad about him, he mumbled against Ron's shoulder. Ron sighed, but he didn't loosen his embrace. Don't blame him. He doesn't deserve it. Fine, said Ron. You didn't know him. It wasn't what you think. Okay. He saved me from myself. More than once. A pause. Okay. I need you to believe me. I believe you. Harry pulled away first to embarrass to meet Ron's eyes. If you try to hurt yourself again, I'll hurt you first though. Ron told him, reaching into his pocket to retrieve Harry's wand. I'm serious. Works for me. Harry said, the corner of his mouth tugging just slightly upwards. Same result, you know. A moment of cautiousness followed, and then Ron snorted. Harry felt himself chuckling, too. You're grossed out, aren't you? Traumatized, Ron admitted. I knew someone made you gay. I just knew it. That's not how it works, Harry said gruffly. I, no, don't tell me how it works, please, Ron begged. Hermione gave him a harsh glare, and Ron shrugged his shoulders. You should have said something, Hermione said. Why, so you could try and talk me out of something that's already gone? So we can be there for you, you idiot, Hermione replied, kissing his shoulder. I can't believe you went through this by yourself all these weeks. He died in my arms, Harry whispered all of a sudden. It was like he had just realized that Zephyr said, really, really, it'll get better, Hermione said. You'll see. The paint won't last forever. Without fully believing it, Harry nodded. Hermione wiped his face with her hand. It's the syntax of things, she went on. He looked up. The what? The syntax of things. Everything happens when it has to happen. Everything happens in order. Grief comes from loss. But something new comes after grief, too. The most difficult battle, as it turned out, was the one after the need for survival was over. 
Would life ever again resemble what it was until this day? Would he ever again feel the warmth Severus's arms invoked? The wind whistled through the bushes and the trees, and Hermione buttoned up her outer cloak in silence. So, now what then? Harry asked, trying to sound optimistic. He never thought he'd still be here once the war was over. He never thought he'd really make it. It occurred to him that he had no idea what to do with his life from now on. We can start by trying those cupcakes Luna made, Hermione offered. They look intriguing, sort of. The green things made of slimy tentacles, Harry asked. I'll choke up, Ron added. But yeah, mostly tentacles. Harry was the first to break into laughter. It came unexpectedly, exactly like the wind, and Harry welcomed it with an open heart. A cupcake sounded nice. It wasn't much, but it was a start. Slowly, life would find its flow again, or it would birth a new one. This wasn't the end. It couldn't be. Harry had survived so many terrors. He couldn't give up now. He couldn't let himself wander off into the storm when the sun had finally come out. His friends didn't deserve to be faced with another tragedy. He could never do that to them. Stay alive, he thought. If he can't stay strong, at least stay alive. It was a start. Besides, there were still a few things that needed to be done. Before deciding what to do with his own future, he had certain responsibilities to take care of. To clear Severus's name, first of all, that fight wasn't over. He wasn't going to give up on it. On Severus, the Ministry would not get away with simply sweeping him under the rug. And then there was Eileen. Harry couldn't possibly leave her alone, not after having seen all the things that he saw in Severus's memories. He had already booked an appointment for her visit to St. Mungo's to see her, meet her, deliver the news if they hadn't already reached her, or maybe avoid the grim announcement of her son's death altogether and try to get to know her. There was no one else anymore. So Harry saw no other option than to become the one to keep her occasional company from now on. Oh, I almost forgot, Hermione said. I'll be arranging some studying sessions with Kevin over the summer. You remember Kevin, right? He needs some assistance with his newts, and we thought we might help each other out. You're welcome to join us if you want. Newts? Going back to Hogwarts? He wasn't sure. Maybe. Or maybe not too soon. Too many memories. It'd be too much. On the other hand, studying would give him something to occupy his mind with for the time being. Perhaps he needed the, the distraction. I'll think about it, he said, happy to hear that Kevin was still alive. Oh, Kevin, Ron asked. I'm not a good study partner anymore. You never were, Hermione said amusedly. Sounds like you're just jealous of my natural wit, said Ron. Oh, Kevin. Later, Hermione replied dismissively. She turned to Harry. We should go back before the reporters discover us. We'll have plenty of time to talk about this, I promise. If you feel like talking about it, I mean... Go, Harry said. I'll catch up in a bit. Not leaving you alone, mate, said Ron. I'll be fine. I'm going to kill myself, I promise. Ron shook his head determinedly. I won't, Rary insisted. Really, I just... Nope, I swear to tell the cannons. Ron's eyes softened, but he still did not waver. Come on, I swear to tell the cannons. Harry repeated, insulted that such an oath could be questioned. Finally, Ron surprised a smile. Right then, he said, but if you're not back there in five minutes, I'm coming to check. And you'd better be alive. Or what, you'll kill me. Ron supported his weight on Harry's shoulder and pushed himself up. Even worse, he said, I'll tell Skeeter. Harry started, and Hermione rose too. Ah, oh, my rooms are ruined, she complained as she squeezed the water out of them. I'll dry them for you. Ron said, I'll know a spell. God forbid, Hermione said. No, really. Or you could just take them off. Slowly, the sound of their voices faded as they paced away together and vanished into the woods. Alone again. It will be okay. It will be okay. It will be okay. Quite unsurprisingly, the tears came again. Harry inhaled deeply, trying to consume the rapidly cooling breeze or be consumed by it. Or simply become part of the wind itself. One day he'd be with Severus again. One day they'd be together. And tomorrow? Tomorrow Harry would stay home. And the day after, maybe he would even go for a walk. One day at a time. Again and again for as long as it'd take. Eventually the days would become weeks, months, years. And the details of Severus's face would fade. 
First, he'd forget the lines surrounding his thin lips, and probably the glare, and then the way his dark hair felt on Harry's fingers. Next would come the taste of his tongue, then the roughness of his fingertips, the scent of his clothes, and maybe, at last, the sound of his beating heart. It would be okay. Severus's scarf danced madly in his grip, the wind pushing it back and forth. Harry brought it to his nose and smelled it. It didn't smell like Severus, not any more. The scent on it was now the one of worn-out fabric and the bottom of Harry's trunk. Harry kissed it anyway. I'm drunk. I'm stupid. I'm happy. I love you. And maybe it was all lies. Maybe his friends were right. Maybe it was wrong and messed up. And maybe the foundations of it all were frightfully questionable. Maybe the actual story was much simpler than the one Harry chose to tell himself at night. Maybe what he and Severus once had was not at all some great true love, never-ending, everlasting. Maybe Harry had been indeed childishly infatuated and misled all along. Maybe he'd love Severus out of loneliness or boredom because there'd have been no one else around for him to love. Or maybe, without ever realizing it, Harry did truly see in him the father figures that departed from his life unfairly. Severus himself had told him that many times. And maybe in Harry's eyes, some part of Severus always saw Lily. It was possible, entirely possible, and Harry clung to it desperately. This wasn't some sort of destiny or some eternal soulmate's thing. It was only circumstances. It meant nothing. Harry's determination to always forgive Severus's rage was not romantic, not at all. It was the product of inexperience, insecurity, and even obsession. Maybe he needed Severus in his life for reasons deeper than he'd like to know. Maybe it was simply trauma. And maybe if Harry hadn't been forced to live with him, if he hadn't been exposed to all the random details that triggered his bizarre awakening, things would have been different. He could have fallen for Jenny, this time for real. He could have loved her even, and maybe none of this madness would have ever crossed his mind at all. Who could tell for sure? No one. Maybe Severus himself surrendered because the pain he'd never unleashed had finally found a way out. Maybe without Harry, he'd have never known any affection at all. Maybe that's what had lured him in, the affection. Harry wasn't special. Severus had been emotionally deprived all his life. He would have fallen for anyone, and he'd been shown some compassion. It was simply luck that Harry had been the one to show it. And maybe their affair hadn't happened despite their age gap, despite the incompatible sexuality, and despite the dubious morality of it. Maybe it had happened because of all that. Maybe after a life with Tobias and Voldemort and even James and Sirius and that Beatrice woman, Severus did not expect any connection for himself but the broken kind. Maybe he couldn't even imagine that something better did exist. The memories he'd given Harry were unquestionable. They filled in the blanks of how and why, like missing pieces of a puzzle. Harry had fallen for Severus simply because too many people had left. And Severus had fallen for Harry because, despite all reason, Harry stayed. There was more. There had to be. More reasons, more justifications, more explanations that made this technical instead of passionate. Shedding their love away and making it simply a rational response to random events left Harry lightheaded. He needed this. He needed to disprove his feelings or else he'd die. Maybe part of Severus had enjoyed the power play. Enjoyed knowing that Harry wanted him but could not have him. Enjoyed thinking that his nemesis's son lusted after him. Maybe it was satisfying. More explanations, more pleas, more reasons to stop feeling, to stop caring. I said don't stop, Harry moaned. And maybe in the depths of his heart, Severus had always remained that small awkward child that sought nothing but kindness. Maybe in Harry he had finally found it. Wrapping the wet scarf around his neck and tucking it under his shirt's collar, Harry stood. His robes were soaked and heavy, but his hands didn't shake anymore. It was time to go back. It'll be fine, he told himself. Again. Maybe it wasn't really love. Maybe it was nothing. Then Harry was pressed against the wall with a strong hand around his throat and was kissed passionately. The fury made his head dizzy and his heart weak. Their mouths crashed together and Harry moaned in shock as Snape. Or maybe it was all of these things at once that had made the impossible somehow happen. First the pain, then the lack of it, then the need to forget, and then the forgetting. Maybe it was the weight of everything being lifted so slowly from their hearts that all that remained was this. Harry and Severus in a small room with their stupid hopes and their stupid love. 
Mr. Porter, a word, McGonagall called just as Harry was about to settle into an empty chair. She was still on the platform standing next to the colossal stone that was now unveiled. She stepped down carefully and all eyes were on her as she approached him. It occurred to me, she whispered, that the parents may find some comfort in knowing that someone did look after their children until the very end, that someone gave his life so those who survived will never again have to suffer under the reign of a monster. It also occurred to me that setting things right is a moral obligation that should never have to wait. Professor, Harry said, smiling genuinely for the first time in a month. She glanced at his dirty shoes and wet robes, then at his dripping sleeves and his face that was almost certainly red from all the crying. None of it seemed to upset her. Go on, Mr. Potter. The press is practically on their toes. Harry nodded, rushing up to the podium and leaving a trail of dirty water and dead leaves behind him. He was aware of cameras clicking and quarrels and parchments coming to life as the people under him gasped and murmured. Harry swallowed. I... He looked at the people's faces, some grim, some tearful, some simply blank, and then in his hands. Someone cleared his throat. A chair squeaked. McGonagall nodded at him from her seat. I would like to say a few words about someone whose name you won't see written on the stone today. Harry began. His name was Severus Snape, and he was probably the bravest man I've ever known. Because if it wasn't about love, then it was simply about living and not dying. And if it wasn't nothing, then it was simply everything. Because what else is love but everything? End of The Syntax of Things by Arisha If you enjoyed this recording or the content, feel free to leave a comment below or a review of the original story from the link in the descriptions. Thanks to the members for their additional support, and thank you for listening. Chapter 72 is a bibliography. <laughs>